to The Debrief, everybody. Authorities are releasing unsettling new details in the October 23rd disappearance of the daughter of a UFC heavyweight. Police records show that Anaya Blanchard suffered a life-threatening injury which resulted in a loss of blood. Suspect Ibrahim Yazid, they say, was at a convenience store where Blanchard was last seen and that a witness there saw Yazid force Blanchard into a car. Right now, Yazid is charged with kidnapping. Blanchard has not been found. Among the searchers looking for her is the mother of missing teenager Natalie Holloway. The father of a Fort Worth, Texas woman shot and killed by a police officer has died. Marquise Jefferson suffered a heart attack and died at a Dallas hospital on Sunday. A family spokesperson said he died of a broken heart. Daughter of Tatiana Jefferson was shot by then police officer Aaron Dean through a window after a neighbor called police to check on her home. Dean has not yet been formally charged. Tatiana Jefferson's sister told me last month that the family's wait for formal charges has been frustrating. We've never been part of the justice system, so for justice is long, I guess that's what they say, and um, hard, but it's, it's a process. It's definitely a process that we and we would think it would take it would be more swifter but it is what it is and but we're we're here to stand with it no matter what she was humbly apologetic that would that would be her all wrapped up in one she was a humble person and but she knew what she wanted and she knew what was right and she went by those rules and anything else is not her Hundreds of thousands of people signing a petition calling for the Texas governor to stop the execution of death row inmate Rodney Reed. Reed, convicted in 1998 of raping and murdering Stacey Stites, 19-year-old Stites found strangled to death in a wooded area. Attorneys for the Innocence Project say Reed was wrongfully convicted and they claim the family's fiance or the victim's fiance, Jimmy Fennell, is actually the real killer. Activists want a belt found in two pieces near the victim's body tested for DNA. Famed forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden testified for the defense and spoke with law and crime earlier today about what he says are inconsistencies with the state's supposed timeline. Yes, the forensic science, the lividity, the settling of blood, the rigor mortis the, that changes after death uh, point very uh, clearly to the fact that she was dead before 3 a.m. while she was still in her, uh, in her uh, apartment with her uh, fiancé. She was dead, and she was dead when she was put into a truck in which she was found two hours later, early decomposition from the purge fluids while in the truck. And uh, the uh, part of the ligature, the belt, was present near the truck when it was found, and her body was, uh, had been placed someplace uh, where it was found with the portion of the belt, of the ligature belt, next to the body, and uh, part of it next to the trunk, uh, truck. And she was lying in such a position that the lividity uh, on the front of her chest meant that she had been face down the time she was in her residence with her fiancé uh, for four or five hours. Jimmy Fennell was the initial suspect, but police only found Reed's DNA on the victim's body. Reed was in a sexual relationship with her. The medical examiner testified at Reed's trial says prosecutors misconstrued his opinion on the time of death. Dr. Bodden explains why this is a major problem. The, the testimony about the sperm having to uh, been placed in the body a few hours before death was entirely false, and sperm lived in the body for a good four or five hours, uh, four or five days, for four or five days after depositing there, and the dead sperm can be there for months uh, so that saying that they found the swab of sperm uh, meant that it only could have happened two or three hours before was totally wrong, and I think the experts who testified to that have recant was uh, uh, killed, died when she was in the apartment with her fiancé, and that Rodney Reed was not with her when she died. Exoneree and Innocence Project attorney Jared Adams says he has new evidence he plans to file in the case and is hoping that it will convince the governor to stay Reed's execution. The new evidence which will be going into filing sometime today or tomorrow is about Jimmy Fennell admitting to someone in prison that he did it. And let me tell you how significant that is. If someone in prison would have said that Rodney Reed did it, 
then the other side would be swinging that around as if it were a Bible. And so why aren't we doing that now that we have Jimmy Fennell admitting to someone else? And also, by the way, he was tried and convicted for the same type of offense, kidnapping and raping a woman. I've talked to Rodney Reed throughout during the process when I did his evidentiary hearing with Bryce Benjack in 2017. I plan to fly down there next Sunday to, to, to visit him. Hopefully I'm visiting him to give him a hug and that we've been successful with staying this execution. And I, I'll just tell you this. When someone is going through something like this in prison, it is easy to have yourself filled with doubt. But I could not go on that way. I lived each day like I was getting out the next. And I promised myself if I was successful, I would become a part of this to help it. And that's what I've done by becoming an attorney. Two attorneys are with us tonight here on The Debrief. Gigi Gonzalez is in Miami. Linda Kenny Budden with me here in New York. So, Linda, you were here talking with your husband about right. what's going on in this case. So, so my whole thing is, look, if you're going to put somebody to death, test the evidence, test the DNA, run it through CODIS, do whatever you have to do. Right. Am I off on no, this? No, no, I agree with you. And also, let's face it, there's so many other questions related to there. Even if that didn't yield anything, my gosh, I mean, put him away for life. Give him the clemency position because he's still going to be away. Way. And if you have doubts, as the, as the Innocence Project was brought up, why do we need the death penalty in this particular case when we have so many cases where the death penalty is warranted and we know finality in those cases? We know your position on the death penalty. I, I'm not going to say. I tried what death I, penalty cases. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm not going to say exactly what I think about it. Uh, but my whole thing here, Gigi, is if we have the death penalty, if we don't have the death penalty, whatever, test the evidence either way. If you're going to have the death penalty, you ought to be certain that you know the person who's being put to death was actually the person who committed the crime crime, right? No, absolutely. Yes. And you know, you have all of this new, you have this confession, this jailhouse confession, you have a uh, new evidence that suggests that, you know, the entire state position is off. You know, why not take the time, however long it takes to explore and figure out exactly what's going on here. One way or another, you're going to get the, a, a good answer. Either we're going to put the person who's responsible for this to death, or we're going to remove an innocent person from death row and charge the appropriate person with this crime. Yeah, I mean, be uh, sure. Let, let's have some certainty in this rather than some potential doubt. Let's move on now. The friend of a Colorado fiance accused of murder dropped another bizarre claim into testimony in that case. Patrick Frazee accused of murdering flight instructor and his fiance, Kelsey Barrett with whom he had a child. Crystal Lee, formerly known as Crystal Kenny, is charged with tampering with Barris' cell phone. She flipped and testified to cleaning up the murder scene after she says Frazee is the one who killed Barris. Barris disappeared after surveillance footage showed her grocery shopping with her baby. Other footage links Frazee to the crime scene, but one of his friends testified that Frazee himself was upset that police were questioning him. Frazee told the friend that no body equaled no crime, according to testimony. And Frazee was apparently bewildered that police were even treating the case as criminal under his supposed paradigm. Crystal Lee faced two hours of cross-examination in this case over her testimony, which named Frazee as the killer. The defense asked why she failed to call the police after she admitted to aborting two of her own attempts to kill Barrett herself. Lee admitted to driving all the way to Colorado from Idaho with the baseball bat presumably used to kill Barrett. The defense dug into Lee's plea deal, which might allow her to skip prison entirely for testifying that Frazee was the one who finally killed Barrett. A hearing this week will determine whether statements made by a man accused of killing an Iowa college student will be used against him at trial. The hearing will seriously affect the case. Here's a look at what we expect. Police say this man, Christian Bahena Rivera, gave them turn-by-turn -turn instructions on where to find the body of Iowa college student Molly Tibbetts. When police first spoke to Rivera, he said he knew nothing about Tibbetts. Later, he let police search his Chevy Malibu, which was similar to one seen circling four or more times where Tibbetts was last seen jogging. Inside the trunk, bloodstains, and her DNA. At issue is what the state calls an unfortunate failure by a police officer to read Rivera his full Miranda rights in an interview at a police station. 
Court documents say the officer did not have access to a Miranda card and failed to tell Rivera that anything he said could be used against him in court. The state called the warnings nearly complete because the officer did tell Rivera that he had the right to remain silent and to speak to an attorney, but the state concedes what Rivera said should be suppressed. Prosecutors say Rivera went from a denial of killing Molly to not remembering and said he had a memory problem because he hit his head on a goalpost while playing soccer in Mexico. He shifted and said it was possible he did something to Molly but just couldn't remember. He then admitted using a vacuum to clean his car and admitted to being on a gravel road in Malcolm, Iowa at 4 a.m. when Molly disappeared. After asking other officers to leave the room, Rivera told one officer he remembered fighting with Molly, putting her in his car, and that there was blood. He couldn't remember if Tibbetts was dead or alive, but he did remember that we were in the corn, that's where I put her. Then Rivera led officers to the location where they found her body. That's where Rivera received his full Miranda warning. After receiving it, he continued to talk. The state relies on a 2004 U.S. Supreme Court case to argue that while these statements must not be used at trial, any physical evidence found can be used. Back now are Gigi Gonzalez and Linda Kenny Bodden. So, Linda, a nearly complete Miranda warning, unfortunate. Okay, let's get even beyond that language. Who does an interview in a police station and then the state has to argue in this big stack of documents that they didn't have access to a Miranda card at a police station. Uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. I had you laughing a little bit in the interim, Aaron, because, you know, on the back of my cards, I have the Miranda warning. So in case any client could stop, you just give this to the police officer. Maybe they should have come here and I could have given them a Miranda card to use. Gigi, I, I'm scratching my head here, you know, and the state's doing somersaults and backflips and all sorts of acrobatics in these court documents that are pages and pages and pages long, trying to make sure that the physical evidence stays in, because if the judge turns around and applies the uh, fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine to the unmirandized statement, then, then basically they don't have the body. Exactly. The only reason why this body was produced was because of the statements made uh, by the defendant without his Miranda rights being read. And, you know, and they tried to argue that this wasn't a custodial uh, you know, interrogation, that he wasn't under custody. He was in a police station for 11 hours, eight of those hours he spent talking to them. You know, at some point, why isn't the police officer saying, hey, uh, let's, let's get this Miranda rights in here. Let's just let him know that anything he says is going to be used against him because he seems to be talking a lot. Oh, yeah. I mean, but you know how that here. goes. We, they give them food. They tell them the door is right there. If you want to make a call and leave, you can. And that's how they say it's non-custodial interrogation. No need for Miranda. They said they were going to read him his rights once they realized they were going to put an immigration detainer on him. Uh, but here, Linda, we've got a situation where a defendant basically continues to talk even after the um, second Miranda right. warning in some circles, the first real Miranda warning in others. He basically continued to spill everything that I right. just said in that piece a second time, so that'll all come in. That's we just right. won't hear what I just reported. That, that's right, and the courts have chipped away at Miranda so much that Miranda hardly exists. It's amazing even to get a case where a prosecution will say, hey, we get, we concede on Miranda here, and that's because they have other evidence, Aaron, that they can go for. Yeah, exactly, I mean, the state did concede in an attempt to try to get the physical evidence in. We just won't use that batch of statements. We will watch that here as it comes to us this week. And still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, we're going to head back to a complicated Florida trial where a man accused of killing a mother and three children, including one of his own, claims he's factually innocent. He says it was a drug cartel behind the killings. More on that case when we return. update now on the retrial of a man accused of murdering a mother and her three children. Prosecutors say Henry Segura is the one who in 2010 killed his girlfriend Brandy Peters, their three-year-old child, and Peters' twin six-year-old daughters. The motive, prosecutors say, was Segura's $20,000 child support debt. Segura says he's innocent and that Peters was the victim of a drug cartel. The defense says Peters took $100,000 in drug money and that the cartel left a calling card behind when it killed her and the children. A jury in Segura's first trial deadlocked after 19 hours of deliberations. The defense wants to call 
James Carlos Santos to testify about this alleged cartel hit on Brandy Peters. According to court documents, Santos is in prison on a drug conviction. The defense says he used to be a member of a Chicago-based gang and that he hired Brandy Peters as a mule to shuttle drugs from Tallahassee, Florida to Texas. Documents say Santos will testify that Peters earned $8,000 per trip and made two trips a month. The documents also say Santos warned Peters her life was in danger after the cartel caught her skimming money. Investigators say the suspect used a 32 caliber gun to kill Brandy and Tamaya Peters. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement compared projectiles found in the home to make that determination. The actual murder weapon, however, has never been recovered. Opinion after looking at the microscopic markings and the imperfections on the fire on the on the projectiles uh, it was my opinion that the 10 projectiles were fired from the same unknown firearm and were you able to make a determination at the kind based upon those landing groups and markings uh with the twist about what kind of firearm will you would typically see from these projectiles being fired from uh basically on the after entering that information at the database it, it included the specifications included revolvers manufactured by smith and wesson uh, both in 32 Smith and Wesson and 32 Smith and Wesson Long, uh, and from the characteristics, uh, one of the firearms could possibly have been a, what's called a top break firearm. And what that means is, if you look at that firearm on the on the photograph right there, that cylinder comes out, it swings out. A top break, the firearm would actually break open from the top. You put the cartridge in and close it back up. Uh, it doesn't mean it is a top break, uh, but that was one of the ones that showed up. Okay. So it could be either top right or this kind of revolver is what we're talking about. Correct. Okay. But it definitely the lines and grew uh, the uh, the lands and grooves indicated was probably Smith and Wesson revolver of some kind. Uh, more likely not. And again, I'll emphasize the the list is not all inclusive. Doesn't include every single firearm made. Let's turn now to testimony from last week from one of the defendant's ex-girlfriends. She says he texted her the night of the murders, but her memory's fuzzy as to where Segura said he was. This witness asked us not to record her face. It would have been later in the evening I was preparing to go to a party that night. So it would have been probably, I don't know, somewhere between 9 and 11. I'm not sure. Okay. Fair to say, obviously, it's been a long time since. It's been a long time. Okay. Um, do you remember anything about where he said he was? I'm not sure that he told me he was anywhere. I, I don't recall that he told me he was anywhere. I recall... Some, somehow I got the impression he wasn't at home or he was headed home. He may, he may have said something. To be honest, I don't remember. Does any, did he remember anything about him saying about passing public or going to public or anything along those lines? Something? Vaguely, yes. So possibly that, that he was talking to you about possibly on that evening going by a public or in the general vicinity of a public? I remember that I was getting my nails done at a public. And, and so that could have been where the, the comment came from. I, I just don't remember specifically. Another of the defendant's ex-girlfriends testified about their volatile relationship, including when she called Segura's wife to tell her she was having an affair with him. This witness also says she had to file a restraining order against Segura. Plus, she says Segura asked to use her gun just before the murders. Here's direct and cross-examination. I was just getting ready to go out of town. He came over there, lip quivering. He was red. He asked me, could he use one of my gun? And I told him, like, if I come across something in the street, you know, like a burner gun, I'll let him know. Because, of course, we were cool. A, a burner gun is like, my name ain't on it. Somebody in the street selling a gun. Or, so you're talking about a street gun, one that's not connected to you? Not connected to me, yeah. And you told him you let him know, but did you ever give him a gun like that? No. You didn't contact the local law enforcement. No. You contacted Crime Stoppers. Yes, I did. And you did that so that you could get paid money, correct? Wrong. I did that for discovery or for if something was to happen to me or him. If I ended up in this situation, that was my thing that I was going to have with the date on it. One of Segura's friends is an Army veteran and a firearms security specialist. He testified that back in 2010, he offered the defendant welding work in Afghanistan, making a six-figure salary. But Segura, the defendant, could not go. The defendant couldn't get a visa because he owed that back child support that the prosecution says is the motive here. That same friend also testified that Segura did have a 32 revolver, the same type of gun investigators believe is the murder weapon. Here again is direct and cross-examination. I seen it in the front seat of uh, this vehicle, this Buick uh, he used to own. He was getting ready for a job to head out. That's when I seen it. 
would have been around 2010? It was prior to that. It was before that, months before that. Months before November 2010? Yes. All right, so in the summertime 2010? Probably so. Uh, June, July, somewhere in there? Somewhere up in that time frame. It's been a while since okay. we had that. You know. And that would have been about the same time you're talking now about the jobs in Afghanistan and stuff, right? Correct. You never saw him with that gun after you saw him in the, t in the summertime, correct? Correct. And that was before he got shot, before he got that injury. Correct. Back once again, Linda Kenny Baden and Gigi Gonzalez. So, Linda, what do you make of some of this testimony here? We've got people piling on Segura saying he's just kind of a bad guy. He owes all these women money. A lot of women don't like him. He's here, there, and everywhere. Does that make him a killer? Well, then there should be bodies everywhere, certainly there, because obviously he had a child with another woman. He's married. I mean, there's no indication that in the past, uh, except, except for the fact that he needed a gun to protect himself because he had been shot previously, he'd been a victim of violence, that brings us any closer to whether he did this crime. That's the problem I'm having with this case. Gigi Gonzalez, I want to know exactly what this other person is going to testify to, this Santos, who we talked about a couple of minutes ago. What's he going to say? Because this is new. We didn't get a lot of that in the first trial. Right. Well, I'm curious to know also, I believe that he's going to testify that he's the one that put out the hit. Um, you know, and it's especially interesting because Santos is the one that brought in um, the victim into this cartel situation. So for him to have to put out the hit, it kind of goes to that narrative because the cartel likes to see their own take care of problems with it. Yeah, okay, so Linda, are people going to believe this guy if he gets up there in some sort of prison outfit and says, oh yeah, you know, it wasn't this defendant, it was my drug cartel who killed all these people and left this spade behind as a calling card? Because, yeah, that's our calling card. Well, the problem you have here is he's confessed to other crimes that didn't happen. But there's a tape of two other people discussing this, and one of them says that I killed her because she was a mule and she was stealing money. So, you know, there's some pretty good evidence that, uh, indeed, that the, the weapon that's never been found, the, the pulling out of the phone cord doesn't have Segura's DNA. Nothing in terms of the struggle has Segura. If I grabbed you Aaron Keller right now, I, you'd have my DNA on you. I'm, I'm, I'm being careful here, Linda. So, so does all of this add up to reasonable doubt? Yes. That's the question. Yes. For some, jurors I, for some jurors, I think it will. You're always looking for that one juror with reasonable Only doubt. Only need one. I, I know. I know how you I know how you work it. Linda Kenny Bodden, Gigi Gonzalez, appreciate your time here on the debrief. As always, we're gonna wrap things up for the night tonight. Of course, we're gonna be back live with testimony in the Henry Segura case starting tomorrow after a couple of days off. And we'll be watching for the Molly Tibbetts hearing this week when that picks up on Wednesday. Have a good night, everybody. See you tomorrow.